We have future power rankings to go over. The Hornets, they catch a stray from an NBA star. And where are we now in the free agency market? We'll talk about all of it today on Locked On Hornets. We're Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. In a minute, cuz we live. We live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free. We're available anywhere you get your pods, and that does include YouTube. This episode is also brought to you by FanDuel. We always appreciate them sponsoring the show, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. That's Doug Branson, too. You can find him on a Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com, doing a funky wave on YouTube, and I'm Walker Mayo. You can catch me on WFNZ every weekday from 12 to 3. So I saw in the rundown today that you had a 2024 mock draft to get to, (laughs) and you also have power rankings. Look, one of them had to go. I couldn't do both. But power rankings is what we're going to lead off with because both are Doug content. Oh, man. I love a good July power ranking. There's no, it's like Christmas in July. There's nothing like a July power ranking to get me going, get my goose going. Oh, man. Well, I mean, even that, the power (laughs) rankings and also the mock draft. I mean, when I saw the 2024 mock draft, not in the third segment, no, not saving for last, but in the second, like meaty enough to be the middle part of the sandwich, you wanted to go with. I don't even, I can't tell you the prospects in the 2024. I know Bronny, Cooper Flag, I think, is going to be out there. I or Maybe not. Maybe he's the next class. I, oh. I don't know anything about the high school guys. I oh, just listen, don't. all I'm going to say is that Brian Kalbrowski of USA Today has the Hornets in the number three slot selecting a point guard, Isaiah Collier, out of USC. Not Bronny James uh, from USC, but Isaiah Collier. By the way, I uh, hope, hope Bronny's doing okay after the cardiac arrest. Man, yeah. that's a scary thing. As a as a new dad, that's like frightening. Anytime you hear about somebody's kid uh, getting hurt in any way, it's it's ugh. so. Uh, hopefully, he's doing all right. But they've got Isaiah Collier out of USC, and you know another backcourt mate for for Lamelo Ball. Are we gonna have to yeah. do the debate again? No, <laughs> like, no. I can't. I really hope not. I hope nope. that it's a Cody Williams, a forward of some kind. Uh, that we're talking about a draft. Hopefully we're talking about somebody. Maybe Kyle Boone from CBS Sports has them going number 11, which I think is a safe bet. <laughs> you know, just, just slot them in number 11. That's so classic, Hornets. Go ahead and pick 11. Not number three, not out of the lottery, but pick right there at the back half. Pick at number 11. By the way, with the whole debate coming up in the NBA draft, does LaMelo need another backcourt mate if that would happen? Doug, I'm just not going to watch any guards this year. Not doing it. It's all front court, baby. No, no guard prospects. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to evaluate you anymore after last year. Not going to happen. I just can't. I can't go through it again. Yeah, you're right. Um, Okay. So we'll just talk about the guys that are already on the team, which is actually still a little tough because of the free agent limbo that the Hornets are still in with PJ and Kelly. We can get to that in the next segment, but we'll just roll with the power rankings with the roster as currently constructed because the athletic An article written by Zach Harper, or at least an excerpt written by Zach Harper of The Athletic, has the Hornets at number 29, Doug. So he's kind of in line to think the Hornets are going to be picking closer to number three than number 11 in the 2024 NBA mock draft. What is some of the reasoning, and do you agree with it, the Hornets being 29 at this point in the offseason? Uh, Harper writes, maybe the return of Miles Bridges and addition of Brandon Miller will start to spark a proper supporting cast for LaMelo Ball, but the Hornets don't seem to have anybody you feel is a definite running mate for him. The Hornets had a lot of problems last year and missed a ton of talent on the court for big stretches. They were also the worst offensive team in the league. It doesn't make sense that this team was better defensively than offensively. They need Miller to look like a star, especially if Henderson is the real deal in Portland. And while I don't love that they're 29th, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me because Bridges, I think, is a question mark. Brandon Miller, how good can he be in year one? Yeah, I think he's going to be really, really good. But how good can he be in year one? I think that's a big question mark just because of, you know, his body at this point and all of the recovery that he had to do over the offseason from Mono. I just don't know if he's going to be able to jump in and help immediately. And so that that big question, you know, who is the the running mate, if you will, for LaMelo Ball? I don't think that question has a solid answer. And until that until it does, you can't justify really even pushing Charlotte out of 
the bottom quartile, even if you consider all the context with the injuries last season. I mean, I think that's the main argument to say that 29 is too low, that, hey, th this is a better team. They obviously finished poorly last season because they had so many injuries, but they also don't have a lot of depth. So when you have injuries and you don't have depth, you're a bad team. Yeah, they were the fourth worst team in the NBA last year at 27 and 55. They were only better than Detroit in the Eastern Conference. You go Detroit. to the Western Conference, Houston and San Antonio were 22 and 60. Portland was 33 and 49. So Portland in the Western Conference, that was the first team you get to before you get to a record better than the Charlotte Hornets. All of that was because of the injuries. So I've been asked on a couple of hits this week, do you think the Hornets can make the playoffs? What is the most optimistic of outcomes? And for me, Doug, the way I answer it is the most optimistic of realistic outcomes. If let's just say PJ comes back, because I mean, regardless of what you think about PJ or not, just some more help at this point, you're losing someone you're getting miles bridges, but you have to go back to two years ago. You don't have to compare them to last year's team. Go to two years ago when they got to the play in when miles was playing like a fringe all-star when LaMelo literally was an all-star, when Terry and Gordon were also somewhat available, uh, you know, Gordon is never going to be 100%. So go back to that, and you're actually losing Kelly Oubre and PJ while gaining, I guess, Mark Williams, which is a big piece, but you get the idea. The scales balance out to the point where it looks like a play-in team right now. The most optimistic for me is a top six seed if all of the 50-50 propositions move in a positive way but we've discussed it before. It's not anything that I think is good practice to rely on with all of the positive outcomes. Brandon Miller being a bona fide stud year one, Mark yeah. Williams realizing his potential even more. So year two miles yeah. bridges picking up right where he left off after all the time he missed mm -hmm. in what is going to be his first year back since mm -hmm. he pled no contest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, all of those 50, 50 propositions, I'm not going to just go ahead and bank as working out mm -hmm. for him. There are tiers of NBA teams that you can break up into like your top echelon of teams where they can't have multiple things go wrong or the season's over. Okay, that's your top that's your top tier teams. Then you have a, another set of teams <clears throat> in the middle that that need a thing or two to break right. They need one player to to have a career year and or, you know and they could probably have one thing go wrong. They could have one injury to like a mid-level player, but they you know they can't have their star player be out for the rest of the year. Or they're they're completely out because they have one star. You know they got one star to, and a and a lot of really really good role players. They need one of those good role players to break right. Okay, then you have a set of teams where th they they can't have anything go wrong. They absolutely just cannot have anything go wrong. Every you know most everything has to break right. And then you have the Hornets where it's not just that nothing can go wrong. Mm -hmm. It's that everything has to break right. As you just chronicled there, you have to have multiple players having career years. I'm confident LaMelo can do it if he can stay healthy. I'm not confident about any of the other guys. It's all a big gamble. And that's not me being negative. That's just me being realistic. And that's me recognizing that this team has been betting this way for multiple years, despite evidence to the contrary with the play-in blowouts they mm -hmm. there's just it, that's what's frustrating about offseason after offseason of inaction and ba basically betting on the players that you invested multiple years in via the draft is that everything has to break right and and I just I'm not confident that's going to happen but Walker if it does you and I will be sitting on this show with, you know, our eyeballs completely open wide, being shocked and and celebrating that it happened. But it's just it's when you don't go out and acquire talent using all of the means at your disposal, trades, free agency, draft. When you don't do that, when you trade first round picks for worse first round picks, when you do that, you are essentially saying everything has to go right. And, you know normally it doesn't Th things happen well and doug if everything goes right what does that scenario look like at the end if everything works out and everything goes right are we talking about that six seed because top five seems a little too lofty and out of the realistic realm so if we go top six that last spot where you can avoid a play in tournament appearance is that what everything going right looks like because to me, yeah, it is. That, that's everything, and even more so, to be honest with you. So, well, that, it's because it's because it's Lamelo All NBA conversation. It's Miles Bridges All Star. It's you know, 
Mark multiple, Williams, you know, all in like maybe all defense. defense all, both. Yeah, all defense. Yeah, for sure. Which he wants. He wants multiples, as he revealed in his light Q and A, where he also revealed that he would rather fight a chicken every time he gets in his car. That's just. It's still. The more I think about it. It's baffling to me that you would want to fight a chicken literally every time you step into your car. Maybe Mark Williams doesn't get into a lot of cars. He's a tall individual. Because an orangutan will kill you. I don't want to have this conversation anymore. <laughs> orangutan, you're dead. You don't want orangutan. to die. Anyway. <laughs> We're bringing it back. We're bringing back the debate. Yes, everything has to go right. Mark Williams. Um, like. It, and maybe, yeah, I mean, Brandon Miller has to has to perform immediately, too. It's a lot. I mean, you, you can see some of the stuff it's, happening, but it, it's, it's a lot. Body. It's a lot coming off of a year where, well, I'll just let Mitch Kupchak say it. We don't have any all stars on this team. Mm, that's that's yeah. the year they're coming off of. Mm -hmm. OK, so if you're if you're Zach Harper, you look, I, I think Zach Harper, like, actually digs down into the details like he he can understand the context of the injuries last season. It's not like. Yeah, you know, this is this is the athletic. It's not some you know uh, bozo bogus power ranking here where they're where they're just kind of skipping on the surface. We didn't find the bleach, Bleacher Report intern that was from like four years ago. Right? Know? No, this no, this is a legitimate thing, and I and so, but even he, he cannot justify moving this team when they didn't. They, it's not that they haven't added anyone. It right now they're still sitting in the negative. <laughs> because because you've got P.J. Washington and Teo Maladon still sitting out there in restricted free agency and Kelly Oubre in unrestricted free agency. It's mm -hmm. not that they, they added Brandon Miller for sure, but, I mean, that that's a guy that I think everyone, even the people that are optimistic about Brandon Miller, are saying, look, you know, year one might be a little rocky. You're going to have to be patient with this kid. It's, it's so, all going to be about the shooting, right? It's going to be the Malik Monk thing, except you hope Brandon Miller can deliver on it year anyway. one. It's that the shooting comes in right away. And he can help out, and that would if he shoots thirty-seven percent from three, that's good. And he does it on what five attempts per game? Could we get that number out of a rookie? Yeah, I think that's the way that he helps, and maybe even defensively making some plays with his long wingspan. All right, you mentioned some of those free agents. Let's talk about that coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We've discussed PJ Washington quite a bit. What about Kelly Oubre? If you look at some of the free agents that are still out there, the best list, the best of list still at this point in free agency. Well, a couple of Charlotte Hornets are still on the list. We're going to talk about it coming up next, but not before we discuss FanDuel. We appreciate them for sponsoring this episode. You can take your first swing at betting on the MLB on FanDuel, and you can get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200 worth, by the way. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's $200 you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to be hitting the first home run, all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you can get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on Major League Baseball than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So go right now. Sign up today. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Vandal, the official partner of Major League Baseball. Free agent talk, more of it coming up next. Locked on Hornets. This is Locked on Hornets. Please, you think I'm a rookie? I'm not answering that five games in. What are you talking about? What do you, what do you, you think? Oh, yeah, do you want me to, do you want me to go ahead and, and dance for you? I'm not a puppet, all right? I'm not saying that one of these guys is the right pick after five summer league games for Brandon Miller. This is me being a puppet. I'll absolutely be your puppet. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. All right, Doug, my question to you at the beginning of the show or before we even started recording was we know P.J. Washington is on the list of the best free agents still available, right? Bobby Marks has put it out there. We're very deep into the process and P.J. doesn't have a home. There are a couple. Christian Wood is another one. Christian Wood, heavily mentioned player. He doesn't have a home right now, but Kelly Oubre is also on that top three, top five list, depending on which one you look at. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about Kelly Oubre because it felt like a foregone conclusion that he was not going to come back under any circumstances. The draft, it comes and goes. They draft the front court player at a position that Kelly would typically play that only furthered our notion that, no, it doesn't seem likely at all that Kelly Oubre is going to come back. And so we focused on other players. Here we are. I mean, what's the date? July 26th. The draft was over a month ago at this point. 
free agency started, what was it, three weeks ago? Mm -hmm. And these guys still don't have a team that they've signed with. Doug, as time goes on, does the likelihood go up that Kelly Oubre could return and play for the Charlotte Hornets next year? No, no. Had they had they drafted Scoot Henderson, you could have convinced me maybe. But I think with drafting Brandon Miller, you're drafting the guy that's going to that you're going to want to soak up all of those Oubre minutes. We went over the rotation. Uh, document that I have the spreadsheet last week and you know you you've got a lot of guys that I think you're going to want to get minutes for at some point in the season and you've got some depth at that wing position now with with Bryce McGowan's you drafted Amari Bailey you've got Cody Martin uh, back hopefully healthy 100% not dealing with any of those weird issues that he had last season after signing the contract and so no that wing position is completely full no vacancy. It doesn't make any sense to bring Kelly Oubre back because that's a guy that needs the ball in his hands a lot. Uh, you know, he's not going to pass a ton. has <laughs> has the lowest like assist percentage in the league for for his position and mm -hmm. for as much usage as he got last season. It was admirable what he was able to do for the team last season, uh, but his his services are no longer necessary for this team. Yeah, I don't think so either, but I, I'm, I'm not going to say 0% chance that he comes back because, Doug, we just, at some point, <laughs> with Maivite showing and revealing itself with 100% display, right? They got to do something. Like, are, are they are they going to bring back anybody? Because I, PJ, <laughs> I still think PJ comes back. But with Kelly Oubre, maybe there is some kind of role where you design him coming off of the bench if he wants to be here, he's unrestricted free agent. So you don't have the weird PJ stuff of like, I think the restricted free agency is what's hurting PJ a little bit on top of other things on him, not getting any deals because the Hornets could just match it because bird rights are still going to be retained for the Hornets. Like you could get Kelly Oubre with whatever right now. And Kelly could sign it. And that's over and done with, you know, wash your hands and you're all good. So this is the thing I don't Kelly, if he comes back on a very small deal, because this happened the last time he signed, I think Kelly held out for a larger contract, didn't get it, ended up signing with the Hornets late in the process. Kelly Oubre signed to the $12 million year non-guaranteed contract the second season. And then the Hornets eventually picked it up, as we all know. So, yeah, I mean, maybe, but I, I'm with you for the most part. I think the the presence of Brandon Miller probably says, no, Kelly Oubre is going to go find a new home. Yeah. Can Kelly play backup point guard? No, yes or he no? Can. no. Can he, he, he play? Can he, he play he, backup power forward? I honestly, it's a great question because I think actually point guard is the thing Kelly Oubre is least capable of playing. I think that is the position <laughs> that I don't want Kelly Oubre playing or getting anywhere close to. So the what? answer to both those questions is no. Yeah, and so again, it's it's about who they didn't bring back to. Dennis Smith Jr., who I just saw like was top three yeah. on the list of defensive plus minus. Oh, the advanced stats are dumb on him, man. I mean, he was yeah. so good. And so the team let him walk for nothing. <laughs> I mean, could have had him for absolute peanuts. Brooklyn sweeps in, calls him on the first day, makes him a priority, says, hey, you play defense really well. We need players who play defense really well. Why don't you come on board? And Dennis Smith Jr., having not heard a peep from the Hornets organization, said, absolutely, I, yeah. I, I'm there. And so defense is what this team needs. I mean, I know, you know Zach Harper saying – it doesn't make sense that this team was better defensively than offensively. And he's saying that because he's saying the, that's how bad the offense was because yeah. when you look at the roster, it's not filled with like a ton of uh, of guys that take a lot of pride on the defensive end. Dennis Smith Jr. was one of those guys. Kelly Oubre played better, was giving you a little bit more in terms of steals and picking off passing lanes, but had a lot of the same problems that both LaMelo and Terry do in terms of containing guards at the point of attack. And so you're letting a guy like DSJ go. You cannot then replace him with more Kelly Oubre. You've got to replace him with more like a guy that I talked about on Monday, a DeLon Wright or a – who I – my brain is always trying to call him Darrell Wright for some reason. I I, I really have to like What's focus on – What's an older player? Yeah, former Golden State Warrior, I believe, Darrell Wright. He exists. I know. If I, I probably did okay. it on Monday. If you go back, you might have caught me doing it. But it's DeLon <laughs> Wright or – Edmund Sumner. I mean, both of those would be upgrades defensively over Kelly Oubre. 
Um, and by the way, the the tweet you're referring to, Sam Vecini actually put down a thread of Dennis Smith Jr. The quote tweet that he had was um, by Swoops GM, and it was the DPM is largely considered the best all-in-one defensive metric. The top 12 defenders last year included Alex Caruso, number one, and Dennis Smith Jr. at number two. Vecini just talked about how much respect that he has for DSJ, and then I'll only read one of the tweets that he had, but he put together a filter, I believe, on NBA stats, just looking at some of the lineups that Dennis Smith Jr. was involved in. And Sam said Charlotte had top six defense from February 14th onward. And it did while playing 21, 22, and 25-year-old centers, plus JT Thor at the four a ton. Smith Jr. made their lives so much easier. Look at these numbers from PBP stats, not NBA, but PBP stats. Not an accident. All were drastically better with Smith on the floor versus without him on the floor like just made when we talk about making guys better you mentioned how bad the offense was Lamelo changes it night and day it's a 180 degree turn mm -hmm. the offensive numbers skyrocket when he's on the floor your offense is going to suffer drastically when he's not defensively dsj is the guy that made other players better uh, by those by those metrics at least with the lineups and so the, the last thing on that michael scotto put this out doug that the Hornets apparently didn't give him the vet minimum. They gave him more than that. Don't know if we heard that from Dennis Smith Jr. Don't know if you believe Mike Scotto on that report and if it was just filtering a message to the fans on the Hornets and what they were saying to Scotto. I don't know. But apparently that was something that was out there that they offered him more than even just the $2.5 million that he signed for in Brooklyn. And maybe DSJ just liked his role better and his uh, you know, his opportunity better with the Nets organization. And which honestly, still yeah, and honestly, that would be fair. Like if if that's the case, if mm -hmm. Brooklyn was promising him, you know, a significant role off the bench, right? Where he's getting 20 plus minutes a game and not sort of a backup point guard to LaMelo, who you I mean, you're really your backup point guard, you're looking for you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 12 to 15, maybe 17, but you're not crossing the 20 minute threshold because, as I said at the beginning of this segment, their wing rotation is super stacked. They've got Cody, they've got Brandon Miller, and I think DSJ may have looked at it and said, look, yeah, more money, but you just drafted Brandon Miller. That's going to probably, you're probably going to, you know, utilize more minutes for him coming off the bench. That's going to eat into my minutes. Brooklyn's promising me a role. If that's the case, and I can let the Hornets off the hook a little bit because I do it, you, you got to give more minutes to Brandon Miller. You got to let the rookie cook, let the rook cook, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I, I'm okay with that. But, you know, the fact that I, I think what bothers me is that it seems like Brooklyn made the first call. Whereas I think the Hornets seem like as an organization, at least under this iteration that may be changing very soon, can't seem to walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. They can't, they can't manage all of this. They can't prioritize things correctly. And, and I think that DSJ should have been made a priority and maybe sold on a little bit bigger role that could have morphed and transformed as the year went on. Well, it's that phrasing that Brooklyn made DSJ a priority that leads you with that feeling, you know, that the Hornets didn't make that first call and unfortunately couldn't get the deal done if they wanted to get it done at all. All right, one more segment to go. Coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We talk about who would win a battle between a couple more animals. Nah, I'm playing orangutans, chickens, <laughs> that debate. It's over and done with. We're actually going to get to a stray, the Hornets way, from an NBA star. We're going to talk about that coming up next. Last segment, Locked on Hornets. Doug, I, I would say a clip of Jason Tatum talking to campers or an AU team or whatever. I didn't know who he was talking to, but there's, there's a clip that went maybe mini viral within the Hornets community, but it wasn't for a positive reason. Jason Tatum was, uh, <laughs> I guess, trying to give a rah-rah speech to these kids to play basketball every single day with 100% effort. And well, it doesn't matter whether you're playing the Lakers or the champion Denver Nuggets or another star laden team. You also have to bring that energy for the lowly Charlotte Hornets here from Jason Tatum. Man, I don't decide. Shit, we playing the Hornets tonight. I'm a chill. <laughs> I only get to go to Charlotte two times a year. Somebody paid their money to come watch me play. Like not trying to be arrogant and like, like it's a bunch of kids in there, my shoes and my jersey. In. And just because we playing Charlotte on <laughs> NBA League Pass on a Monday, <laughs> there ain't nobody f***ing watching. No, I am there. No, no, come on. on. That's not what the, the, the great players, the best players do. So the way y'all compete in the middle, 
I loved it. Competing, talking, <laughs> block your shots, hard fouls, but still being safe. Like, that's basketball. But then you can't go on the side that's like, ah, right, we ain't playing them. They still watching. They still evaluating. They didn't come to see me play. Paolo or Brad, they know what we can do. Y'all in the future, y'all next. So just keep that in mind, like, rank player, not big game, not big game, like, compete, yeah. play basketball, because don't take the for granted. Doug, Inspir where I inspiring, end up, inspiring message, unless is. you're a member of the Charlotte Hornets. <laughs> no, honestly, where I end up is don't take Charlotte Hornets games for granted. I think that's Jason <sighs> Tatum's message at the end of all of this. We're, we're down here now, aren't we? Like, this is, th there's you're no right, you are Sacramento to help us out. There's no Clippers organization. That that was the first team to go. When you see teams getting lifted in the basket from the depths of the well that you've been trapped in for 10 years, you saw the Clippers go up first. Sacramento, they just got helped out last year as the three seed. And here we are. Here we are as the Charlotte Hornets. And now we are the example for NBA stars to use to convince their campers to play hard no matter what team you're playing against. Yeah, but but hold on. You know, Jason Tatum, come on. I mean, you win a ring first, and then you can <laughs> – then you can put the other argument entire... I need, Sean. Yeah, look, wow. man, how many rings do the Charlotte Hornets have? Zero. How many rings does Jason Tatum have? Uh, zero. Perfect. Same amount. Okay, there so you before go. you go putting other teams' names in your mouth, you know, maybe go wow. win a ring. That's, <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Like, just do something. Like, achieve something. And mm -hmm. then maybe you can start talking junk about entire teams because it was unnecessary. You didn't, have to, you didn't have to name the Charlotte Hornets. I mean, I get in his last five games against the Hornets, he's averaged 28, oh. 7, and 3 on splits of 54, 43, and 92. <laughs> so maybe he's just like, that's the, you know, when he thinks about eating, he thinks about, the Charlotte Hornets because he has over the past five. Although I will say, I do recall recent memory, uh, a couple of games before that, LaMelo doing a pretty good job locking Jason Tatum up. So, you know, maybe there's some future hope. Uh, do you want to hear his last five games against the Hornets? I mean, he's I just gave you the averages, but go ahead. Yeah. Hit me because no, I know there's, no. a, I know I, I'll say if memory serves, there's a 40 burger in there. There's a oh, 50 there's burger. There's a 50 burger in there. How about two 40 burgers and one 50 burger in the last, oh, man. like Jason Tatum, he means this message more than you think he means this That's message a lot of meat. To, to, to play against the Charlotte Hornets. I don't know if it's a privilege, but he absolutely brings his a game. 44 points, 35 points, 33, mm. the low mark, 51, mm. 41. The last two games he played, he combined for 92 points against the Hornets. And the worst he shot was 44 percent from the field you know what that is you know what that is walker that is the cookout tray of game logs because you go with the 50 burger and you go mm -hmm. okay that's your that's your entree that's your main course and then it's like oh also you can have a corn dog or a quesadilla as your side item which is a main course in any other meal that's your side item that is the cookout tray of game logs for jason Tatum. I um, mean, by the remember how we had the minutes conversation of who played the most minutes in the league? It was like Pascal Siakam at over 37 minutes, just a little bit. Yeah, Tatum, the last three games, 37 minutes, 40, 37. Why are we playing Tatum so much against the Hornets? Why is that happening? You can give him a rest a little bit. Well, because he obviously, I mean, I think he uses it as a tune-up. Uh, he knows, and a lot of stars know that, yeah, you could rest against the Hornets, but the Hornets don't play defense. So really, the, playing the Hornets is mm -hmm. in a sense a rest, but you get to keep your groove going. This is a groove team. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think health was a big issue last year. The two previous years, it was pride on the defensive end. You know, that's the thing with this season coming up is it ultimately is kind of a reset again, because you are trying to see what Steve Clifford could do defensively with this team with all of the pieces together, because look, if you look at that period right around the all-star break last year in mid-February into late February when LaMelo got hurt again, like that period of 10 or so games, they were playing a lot better defensively and the yeah. offense was starting to improve. And then it all fell apart again after LaMelo's injury. So there is like, if you really dig down deep, you can see a little glimmer of of hope you can see a little glimmer of a team that could put all the pieces together the problem is 
they've got to start over and add in Miles Bridges, who wasn't with the team at all last season. So that's why, in effect, there are so many of these variables that it's hard to really justify saying that this team, without having gone out in free agency or a trade and brought in a a cornerstone piece, a piece that all, all the NBA pundits can look at and go, yeah, that's a that's a guy that's a dominant scorer alongside LaMelo Ball is a dominant playmaker. That makes a lot of sense. You're hoping Bridges turns into that guy, but that's all it is, hope. And you can't power rank off of hope. You got to power rank off of substance, off of evidence, off of what you've seen. And so far, this front office hasn't been able to uh, put together a team that has been able to be evidence of anything. All right. Thanks for making Lockdown Hornets your first listen today. Make your second listen game to game NBA. Maybe the moment. next front office will. Who knows? Maybe. Hopefully. Every top performance, every result. Locked on game to game covers every game from across the league with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow game to game on Locked On NBA. Taylor. Available on YouTube and wherever. You Enjoy Jalen Brown, podcast. by the way. <laughs> Have a great day. We'll be back with you tomorrow. Jalen Clown. 